Welcome to A Date with Darkness podcast, where we will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that we can move through our pain to get the kind of healthy relationships we want, need, and deserve. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based out of Oakland, California. And while I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational in nature, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Some of the information presented on this podcast may be sensitive or triggering in nature to some of my listeners. Therefore, listener discretion is advised. Also, if you find that you want to reach out to a therapist or try to connect with a therapist after listening to the show, please look at the therapist directory on psychologytoday.com, therapyforblackgirls.com. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. I am so excited for the show today. And I think, you know, my podcast has been growing. The number of listeners has been growing. I'm very proud of the show that I put on for you guys. And I've been working really hard to secure having some uh, more notable guests on the show. Um, And all the guests that have been on the show are very wonderful. Um, But I definitely want to try and have a little bit more uh, guests come on that I think you guys guys will really enjoy listening to and today's show is no different you know on today's show I want to talk a little bit about several concepts right that you know things that happen to us that make us more prone to having relationships with narcissists and some of the things that I want to talk about today I have a very special guest on the show today Um, the, the the topics include having nice girl syndrome compartmentalizing your emotions or developing a syndrome called learn helplessness after you have been through something that is abusive or traumatic. And we're going to talk about how those things impact you and how you can come out of it. So without further ado, here's my guest for today. Hi, welcome to the show, Beverly. Well, thank you. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. I had a quiet fourth, so I'm nice and relaxed. All right. And so, Beverly, um, thank you so much for being on the show. But for my listeners who may not be familiar with you, can you talk a little bit about you and what you do and what drives your passion behind what you do? Well, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been a psychotherapist for almost 40 years. And I write self-help books, and I've written 23, I think, at this point. Uh, And um, my focus has been emotional abuse and sexual abuse. Uh, And my latest book is kind uh, kind of addressing both of those issues. Okay, Great. And so t- talk a little bit about what drives your passion behind those things. Okay. Being a psychotherapist and well, uh, yeah, well, I was up. both, I was both sexually abused as a child and emotionally abused. So that's kind of the core of my passion. Uh, and I find that, you know, even before I specialized in working with people who were emotionally abused or sexually abused, I found that most of my clients had ended up that they'd had that experience too. Um, and so uh, it was a combination of my own personal experience and interest in that, those topics and the fact that I was addressing what my clients were focusing on. Absolutely. And because you've written so many books, are you able to recall the titles of all those books? Um, yes, if, but I don't really <laughs> want to right now. But yes, uh, on emotional abuse, the first book was was. Actually, I wrote the first book on emotional abuse that was ever written about how to recover from it. Wow. And it was called The Emotionally Abused Woman. And that was written 20 years ago. And it's still in print. Um, oh. Yeah. And then I also wrote the first book on sex- healing sexual abuse. Uh, and that it came out the same year, uh, unfortunately for me, but fortunately 
for the public. The public needed it. But my book was called The Right to Innocence, and it was about healing childhood sexual abuse. Of course, just my luck, that same year, The Courage to Heal came out. <laughs> Oh, yes. Also a classic. Yes. Yeah. Well, The Courage to Heal kind of just wiped my, it in some ways, kind of wiped my book off the off the shelves, you oh, know, because no. it was so comprehensive and it was it was touted as the Bible about sexual abuse. And it really was. They covered it so comprehensively. Um, but mine differed from it because it was a smaller book and it was kind of more like the beginning steps mm. of facing sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and The Courage to Heal had some graphic examples and things in it that could trigger people. Mine was milder. So those were the differences. I see. I see. And so what got you, it's one thing to be a psychotherapist, but it's a whole nother ball game to be an author. So what transitioned you to be an author and write about these um, complicated subjects at the time, as you said, you were the first to kind of come out with these things. Um, what, what, what drove you to do that? Well, uh, I was always good at writing, not writing nonfiction, not writing mm -hmm. uh, stories or fantasies, but always good at like writing uh, essays, you know, and if there was a, a, a composition that was assigned, I was always good at compositions and essays. And I didn't have any idea how I could ever use that skill. Um, but when I started working with people who've been sexually abused, I actually opened a center for okay. people who were sexually abused. And I found myself repeating the same information to my clients when they first had their first few sessions. Okay. They had questions or I wanted to explain certain things to them. And so I started writing a handbook to give to my clients when they first came in to kind of save time. Mm -hmm. And my handbook kept growing and growing and growing until finally it was a book. And it, it just came about naturally. I hadn't anticipated writing a book at all. And because I'm a good writer, um, I was able to get the book published right away. Uh, I didn't have to struggle at all. Absolutely. Um, and you have written some very good books. And I think although you may have written 23, I may have them all. And I want to say you have a book about mothers or something in the effect. I want to try to pull up the book that you have that I want to ask some questions about. But I also want to talk a little bit about your new book that you have written. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, that book came about, um, I don't want to get political here, but it came about when Trump was elected. Uh oh. Because I was concerned <laughs> yeah. about the messages that were coming out mm -hmm. uh, around sexuality. Um, you know, about his, his message on TV that he grabbed women and how that was going to influence young men and older men. And we already knew that the rate of rape was increasing. Mm. It was a pretty bad environment for women. And I wanted to write a book that would help women, young women especially, um, women who were entering college or entering the workforce. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that would help them. And the book is called I'm Saying No. And uh, the subtitle is... Um, standing up to sexual assault, sexual harassment, and sexual pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very comprehensive. Uh, it goes every, everywhere from how to take care of yourself on a date and be able to say no on a date to how to say no in a relationship. And we might want to talk about that today if we talk about narcissism, because narcissists are notorious for pressuring their partners about sexuality. Um, and so, you know, we can talk about that, but the book covers everything. It covers about sexual shame that a lot of women carry because so many of us have been sexually abused as a Absolutely. child. Uh, the average woman carries a great deal of shame from all the sexual assault she's experienced all her life, from being harassed on the streets to grabbed on the, in the schoolyard. Young kids nowadays are very often, boys have a game where they rush up to a girl and grab her butt or grab her breasts and run away. I mean, it's the assaults are continual, uh, and there's a great deal of shame about that. So mm. I talk about shame a lot, uh, and I just educate women about what sexual assault is and what sexual abuse is, 
And I encourage women to learn how to say no in all those situations. Wow. And you brought up a very interesting point, which was, you know, the whole thing with Trump. And that is a hot topic for a lot of people, just politics and sexuality and how women's sexuality especially is just kind of just thrown out there or disregarded in some way. Um, And a lot of it did start um, as more of a political movement um, or it became more of a political movement when Trump came in office. Do you talk about that at all in your book? A little bit in the introduction. Yeah. (laughs) And I talk obviously about the Me Too movement. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of women are still traumatized because Trump is in office. And again, I'm not talking politically mm-hmm. I'm about the way he bullies, the way he treats women. It, re- re- it triggers women. It reminds them of their abusive father or their abusive uncle or their abusive husband. And so, you know, it's a very, very difficult situation for a lot of women to mm-hmm. even be, you know, hear and see a lot of what's going on today. Mm. And that's an interesting concept as well, um, as well as, you know, women kind of being triggered by things that they see on TV or just everyday actions of people in the world that can be very emotionally triggering for that. Do you have any advice for readers or listeners that are triggered by um, people or situations and things like that, things where they can kind of just manage, um, you know, just how they're feeling or how they're responding to day-to-day triggers and stressors like that? Well, I give women a lot of permission to be where they are. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're triggered constantly, I would encourage you to go to therapy or be in a support group with other women who are experiencing the same things. There's nothing better than having that kind of support. Um, But women are criticized. We hear it all the time because, you know, women don't speak up or they speak up too late or they act, you know, they kind of freeze and kind of let something happen. You know, women are blamed, victim blamed all the time. But I want women to understand there are good reasons why they act the way they act. If a man approaches you and you freeze, that's a natural reaction, especially if you were sexually abused as a child or if you've been sexually assaulted before. The body does freeze when it's in danger. That's one of the ways the body reacts. You know, we've all heard, you know, fight or flight, but it's actually fight, flight, or freeze. And a lot, you know, you see an animal, an animal who's overpowered, who's got a one big dog and one little dog. You don't see the little dog standing up to the big dog very often and barking and biting at him. You often see the little dog laying down, exposing its stomach to show the big dog that it's not a threat. And that's what women, some women have to do. They do it automatically. They become vulnerable as a way to defend themselves. And some women have saved their lives, their own lives by being so-called passive. Okay, Mm -hmm. so women need to understand that whatever way they react to see whether it's somebody, an unwanted touch or, you know, an unwanted proposition or a sexual assault, whatever way they react is appropriate. It's understandable. You know, I teach a lot about self-compassion. That's a big part of the book Mm -hmm. and saying no. In addition to teaching women how to say no and how to stand up for themselves, I also teach them how to have self-compassion when they either can't stand up for themselves or it's really not the right thing to do. Only the woman knows whether it's what, what her approach should be mm. you know, when she's being sexually attacked. So there's, I wanna kind of go back a little bit because I think what you're saying is making a lot of sense. However, I'd like to see if I can make it come to life. Um, And what I mean by that, let's say a woman is being triggered by a man approaching her or by a man uh, saying something to her. Can you talk a little bit about examples of what they can say to kind of acknowledge how they feel or express how they feel? 
Well, I teach women in the very basic concept of learning how to say no. Mm -hmm. it's, it's surprising how many women don't know how to say no. Okay. Or don't give themselves permission to say Absolutely. no. Absolutely. It, it sounds simple, but it can be very, very difficult for a lot of women. So one exercise I have is to just walk around the house and say the word no. Say it within all kinds of volumes, all kinds of inflections, just to get comfortable with the word. And of course, we're talking about the word, but we're also talking in general about being assertive. Okay? So the more comfortable a woman can be just saying the word no and knowing she has the right to do that, hopefully that's going to expand when she's in a situation where she needs to say no, mm -hmm. or she needs to push his hand away, or she needs to walk away. There's, you know, we, I talk about there's all kinds of ways of saying no. You can say no verbally. You can say no by pushing away the person. You can say no by just getting out of there. A lot of women don't get it that they don't have to stay there. Mm -hmm. If they're at a bar and a guy has put his hand on her knee and she's repeatedly pushed her hand, his hand away, or he's repeatedly started talking to her in a sexual way, she doesn't have to sit there. She can just get up and walk away. And again, it sounds easy, but it's not. I'm not at all implying that it's easy. But it's important to know they can do that. I, I talk. I wrote a book called The Nice Girl Syndrome. You that was did. One. Uh, that, that's the one I was thinking of, yes. And yeah. I definitely want to get to that one, yes. Yeah. W women have, you know, <laughs> women have been raised to be nice girls in all kinds of ways. You know, we've been raised to be nice girls physically, emotionally, uh, psychologically. Uh, our culture teaches that. So women think that they have to be nice. They think that if, a, you know, they don't, they want to be polite. Here's this guy coming on to them being completely inappropriate, completely not, you know, respecting their boundaries. And yet they have the expectation that they should be nice to him. Why? Why should you be nice to a man who's being totally inappropriate or bullying you or, you know, being making you feel completely uncomfortable? Why should you be nice to him? He's a stranger. You don't know him. You don't owe him anything. Nobody cares how you look right then. Nobody's judging you whether you're being a nice enough person. You can just give yourself permission to take care of yourself first. And that's what a Absolutely. nice girl is. Basically, she puts the needs of other people, always, almost always puts the needs of other people ahead of her own. Right. Um, and I do want to talk about that because that's actually, I, I don't know why it's a book about mothers, but actually it's the nice girl syndrome. But what I was thinking of, um, as you said that, you know, because that, that's also a book that I've also read for my listeners who haven't read it um, or for our listeners who haven't read it. Can you talk a little bit about where that comes from, that sort of conditioning or that school of thought that women have to be nice or um, I feel like nice um, is more of a substitute for passive or submissive. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Can women, again, need to be self-compassionate around this because women are raised to be still to this day. Women are raised to be nice, like in the family, you know, be nice. And women are discouraged, young girls are discouraged from being angry, and, mm -hmm. and it's okay for young girls to cry, but it's not okay for them to get angry, where it's, it's the reverse for boys. It's okay for them to get angry, but not to cry, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that about boys, but we don't think of it in terms of girls, that girls are really discouraged from ever getting angry, okay? And so that's one of the messages. The other message is, in some households, it's still the message that the man is in charge, the father is in charge. Uh, you do what the father says. You do what the man says. And it gets very extreme in certain situations where the brothers are also considered, the he you know, it's the father and the brothers and the girls and the mother have to kind of wait on the males in the family. Mm -hmm. So that's in some families. Um, the other thing is there's biological reasons why women are, are nice. Women are supposed to be the nurturers, the mothers, the caretakers, and physiologically our makeup is around those situations where we're given certain 
you know, hormones and certain ways of being so that we will be good mothers and good caretakers. Whereas males, you know, are given the hormones and the biology so that they will be the strong ones who go off and hunt and fish and bring home the food, you know. And if physiologically, that really is a factor. Hmm. Uh, women are ten, tend to be more compassionate. Uh, and with our, com- our ability to be compassionate, sometimes that means we are overly nice. Okay? We can always put ourselves in the other person's place. Mm. So we very often back off from our own needs because we have so much compassion and empathy. Mm-hmm. So there's okay. all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Absolutely. And in that book, um, I remember specifically that you say that nice girls can also be mean as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that because I do feel like that comes up a lot when you, um, I don't want to say brainwash, but been brainwashed to kind of be this nice person yeah. that you then walk around with this lens that other people who are not moving and behaving in the way that you are, are just not good people. <laughs> yeah, sure. We get angry if we're not allowed to do certain things. And then we see some free spirited young woman who's just breaking some, all the boundaries and breaking all the rules. No, the, the group of women who are being good, they're going to attack that one. They're going to feel threatened. You, you're supposed to join us. You're supposed to be just like us. So that definitely is an aspect. And there's also an issue with, with women who are oppressed. Uh, in countries where women are oppressed, you will see the women banding together and being vicious to each other just being vicious. They, they're not safe to, it's not safe to be, to stand up to the males in the society, but it's safe to gossip and backstab and be mean to each other. And it's sad because we want women to be supportive of each other, to encourage each other. And in the U.S. that has been, you know, we have talked about that. We've encouraged that. But in other countries, that isn't necessarily the case where women, ban, you know, women uh, support each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, the woman who breaks out of the pack is a threat and the other women are envious of her. So yeah, women can be very mean. And if we're supposed to be nice all the time and smile and be sweet, where are we going to express that other side of us? Everybody has another side. Everybody has an angry, dark side. Where is that going to come out? Well, it might come out with your peers might come out, unfortunately, with your children. Women who are very, very oppressed often take their anger out on their children. So that anger is going to come out in some form. Yeah, absolutely. So there is, um, you know, an element of narcissism to that. Yes, sure. Victims also, people or people who've been victimized also have narcissism, which goes to show you that narcissism definitely runs on a scale and that most, if not everyone, all, we all have a, some amount of narcissism within us. Absolutely. What narcissism is, there's so much misunderstanding. Yes. We've talked about it so often yes. on your show, but you know, we think of the narcissist as somebody who's, um, super smart, super, super talented, super successful. He, th- he or she thinks he's just great, you know, just feels great about himself. And we know now that that's all a facade, that underneath all of that is a great deal of insecurity and a great deal of shame. Narcissists have a whole lot of hidden shame and they tend to project that shame onto other people. But that mm. doesn't take care of the fact that they mm-hmm. carry all that shame. So yeah, we all, if we've been wounded at all, we, we probably have some narcissism because narcissism is also a way to protect our wounds. You know, if, you, if we've been wounded greatly, yeah. we're, you know, some people choose to walk around the world v- being vulnerable and showing their wounds, but not mm-hmm. many. Most will choose to hide those wounds. Mm-hmm. And when we get into hiding our wounds, then we get into narcissism. Mm. Very true. Um, And I I would definitely have to agree with everything that you're saying. What I'm wondering from you is, if we go back to that nice girl who has that syndrome um, and has been conditioned to be this way and then turns around and kind of uh, 
you know, may victimize or shame or project onto others um, feelings of inferiority, feelings of shame, uh, all these other uh, kind of toxic emotions. Is there a way to come out of that? Absolutely. And it comes back to self-compassion. Uh, if, if we can address our own wounds, and that's what I talk about and I'm saying no, is that unfortunately what women tend to do is they become sexually victimized in some way and they talk themselves out of reacting to it. First of all, our, our, our culture, sorry, our culture still mm -hmm. blames the victim but the victim blames herself. Most people who were sexually assaulted or sexually abused blame themselves for it. And they try to move on and they're given a strong message in our culture to move on. Mm -hmm. So what do they do with those wounds? They hide those wounds. I ask mm -hmm. them to bring those wounds out and comfort themselves. I talk about it like reaching inside, finding your suffering, finding your pain and your hurts, and bringing it out and like putting it in the palm of your hand and talking to those wounds mm -hmm. and giving yourself self-compassion. I see that you're suffering. I'm sorry that happened to you. I know that that affected you in certain ways. So addressing wounds mm -hmm. and having compassion for how those wounds have affected you. Maybe ha having even having compassion for yourself for the way you have coped with your wounds. Maybe you have turned it around and become abusive to others. Yes. Having compassion for that, saying to yourself, it's understandable that you would have done that. Doesn't mean it's okay, but it's understandable. Mm -hmm. And we're going to heal our wounds so that we don't continue to be abusive to other people or project our, our suffering onto other mm -hmm. people. But self-compassion is a huge aspect of healing the narcissistic wounds that we all carry. Absolutely. Um, how does one get started by doing that? A lot of people are intimidated by just getting started or just by the sounds of being self-compassionate. Oh, you make it sound so easy. It's not easy for me to do that. I don't really understand how to do that. Or they get frustrated and kind of um, give up with that if it doesn't. Um, produce results uh, quickly or the way that they're looking for. Yeah, it's not easy, especially if you have not received much compassion in your life. If you come from a family where people don't empathize or have compassion for each other, uh, if you've had major wounds and nobody was there to have compassion for you, mm -hmm. you don't know how to have it. Children need to be taught how to have empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. Children need to be taught how to put themselves in the other person's place and feel what the other person's feeling. And they need to be taught how to have compassion for themselves. So no, it's not easy. First steps are number one, addressing your suffering, just acknowledging it. Like I said, with women in particular, they don't acknowledge the wounding from all the sexual assaults they received small and large all their life. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just expected to move, keep moving on no matter how often we're attacked sexually in all mm -hmm. kinds of ways. Uh, so addressing the suffering and then maybe talk, begin, one way to begin to talk to yourself, to, one way to learn compassion is to t ask yourself, what do I wish I had heard? Like if you have, were sexually abused yes. or you were sexually assaulted, what do I wish, I, what words do I wish I had heard right after I was abused or assaulted? What do I wish somebody would have come to me and said? And what would I wish they would have done? Would I, would I wish they hugged me? Would I wish they had said, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You didn't deserve that. You know, I know that's painful. This is horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what words do you want to hear? And then say those words to yourself. Say the words that you wish you had heard. And that can be very, very powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. And I do also think beyond self-compassion, I, I also wonder too, do you have, a, a lot of times it helps people to see, um, that behavior kind of being modeled 
You know, a lot of times, you know, when, we, when we're watching TV, when we're watching all this stuff, a lot of it is junk or it can be negative and toxic. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also wondering, do you have role models um, that you suggest outside of modeling that behavior yourself in the session? Do you have role models or things that you suggest to people so that they can see what kind compare uh, compassion and healthy actually looks like. Yeah. I don't have some specific role models to talk to you about mm -hmm. in particular, but what I ask clients to do is to think about the most compassionate person you've ever met in your life, mm -hmm. the most loving, compassionate person. And most people have at least one. Unfortunately, some people only have one. Yes. But, but, you know, think of that one person. Maybe it's a minister. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was that kind teacher who came and put her hand on your shoulder and when you were crying and said something like, it's going to be okay. Okay. So think of somebody in real life or maybe in a story, maybe in a novel you read, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe in a movie. When I was asked this question, I, the answer, the first person that came to me was the kind, the good witch, Glenda from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> she, she, you know, she had that weird way of talking. Oh, yes, hello, how are you? you know? <laughs> but, so, and, but, you know, I, remember, I don't know if you remember, but how sweet she was. Yeah. So sweet and so loving. And that was the first person I thought about as yes. a compassionate person. I couldn't think of a person in my real life. So I use that, I use that voice. And so you can use the voice or the words of the most compassionate person you've ever met or you've ever experienced mm -hmm. in, in real life or in fantasy or in books or whatever, and use that voice to talk to yourself. Some people suggest that you talk to yourself in the voice that you use when you talk to a pet. Because mm -hmm. you know, it, when we talk to our pets, we usually are very kind and very loving you know, most of the time, yes. okay, you know, and we, you know, talk to yourself like that, you know, hello, oh, I'm so happy to see you, or, you know, that kind yeah. of high pitched, you know, happy voice. So those are voices of compassion. Those are voices of connecting and kindness and acceptance and understanding, you know, mm -hmm. um, so those are good role models right there. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm also, I also kind of want to go back because you had mentioned in terms of, because uh, I'm, I'm making notes here, so that's why I'm looking. You had mentioned to you that um, our society or our culture is one in which uh, we blame the victim mm -hmm. and that we kind of encourage victims or that there's a push for victims to kind of move on. Absolutely. We're very impatient. And that's one of the obstacles that gets in the way of people practicing self-compassion is that they don't want to appear to be self-pitying. And we have a very strong message in our culture that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't pity yourself. You shouldn't feel sorry for yourself. You're supposed to be strong and move on. So I'll give you the worst, one of the worst examples I ever saw. Uh, it was right after a horrible I think it was a tornado or a hurricane or yeah. something, major, major event. And, a, and a, a reporter stuck a microphone in a victim's ha face who just lost their house. Mm -hmm. There's their lost house in the background. Mm -hmm. They just lost their house and everything they owned, okay? And the, the reporter sticks a microphone in the person's face and says, well, how are you feeling, okay? Now, she, the reporter doesn't really, didn't really want to hear from the person. They didn't really want to see the person break down and cry and say, oh, I'm, so, I, you know, my life is ruined. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I can go on. Yeah. They didn't want to hear that. The audience doesn't want to hear that. And, and, the, and the person sitting, standing there, I don't know what they really felt. But what they said was exactly what everybody wants to hear. Well, it's a tragedy. I feel, you know, I've lost everything I own, but I'm going to go on. At least I have my life. At least I'm, you know, I'm here and my children are safe. You know, we want people to maybe acknowledge their, their loss for a minute, but then we want them to be optimistic and say, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I suffered these horrible things, but it's okay. 
We don't want victims to fall down and cry yeah. and show us how much they're suffering. Right. And that's all about, you know, our victim blaming society. Okay. And when someone does say that, God forbid a, a rape victim stand there and say, I'm devastated. I don't know if I can move on with my life. You know, I feel suicidal. I feel, I feel so shamed. I feel so tormented. I don't know what to do. We don't want to hear that. The average person doesn't want to hear that. And the main reason, there's lots of reasons, but the main reason is we all want to believe that we're in control of our life. We don't want to think that we're not control in control. So when we see somebody who is not in control, we don't want to look at that too closely because it reminds us of our own vulnerability. It reminds us that that could happen to me. You know, if not her, that could happen to me. And that's scary as what, you know, as what blank. That is scary to people to see somebody who's, you know, is, was out of control, either by weather or by being overcome by, a, you know, a rapist. We just don't want to acknowledge it because it reminds us too much of what could happen to us. Okay. So I think that's at the core. There's lots of reasons, but that's at the core of our victim blaming. Okay. I want to, yes, and I do, I do agree with you, but I, I also wonder too about that. Um, and there's a specific reason why I asked this question. And the reason is because I agree with you that victims should and or people that have been victimized, I'll say that, should be able to acknowledge and feel their pain. What I have, my question for you is, how much of that is, how much of that is understandable versus how much of it then becomes something that's pathological? Well, it can become pathological yeah. if, it, it, for example, I think in two situations mainly. Mm -hmm. If the person, you probably, everybody probably has learned this by now, the, the phrase learned helplessness. Yes. If you grew up and you had horrific things happen to you and they were constant and there was no way out of the situation, um, there's a phrase that defines that situation. It's called learn helplessness. If there's never a way out, if a rat's in a cage and it never can find a way out, it, it ends up giving up. Okay. It ends up just being passive. You know, in the end, it may scream and yell or not, not the rat is it, but like yeah. the same child at a crib, they're going to yeah. scream and yell for a while. And then when nobody comes, they're going to end up being passive and quiet. They, they'll figure out that there's no help coming and they feel helpless. That child probably, if that re is repeated over and over and over, you might end up with a child who has learned helplessness. And all that means is it's a person who doesn't feel like they have any inner strength. They don't have any will to live. They don't have any will to fight. Their worldview is it doesn't, it, it doesn't help to try to fight. Yeah. There's no use in trying to change my situation. I might as well just accept myself the way I am. So if a person has learned that from an early age and then they are re-traumatized, like raped again, like when they grow up, yeah, that person probably is going to stay in that victim place unless they're helped, unless they're helped to get out of that. And I write about that too. Anger is a really motivating, energizing Absolutely. emotion. And so I teach women especially how to be angry, how to be angry in a constructive, safe way. Mm -hmm. A lot of women, a lot of men too, are afraid of their anger. They're afraid that if they get angry, they're going to act just like their abusers. They're afraid they're going to unleash this horrible emotion that they can't control. And so learning to let your anger out a little at a time, just like learning to say no a little at a time, can empower people who have been victimized, mm -hmm. who have learned helplessness. So you're exactly right. There is There can be pathology if somebody is absolutely stuck in the victim role. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways out of that is by learning how to be angry and practicing their anger and being motivated by it. That's what happened with the Me Too movement, is Absolutely. that women finally got so angry 
We've been putting up with this forever. And they got so angry. And of course, support is important too. They got so angry and they joined together and they created this wonderful thing. So you're right. It can become a pathology if the person isn't taught how to break out of that. Or if they don't even, like you said, learn helpless, if they don't even seek, you know, they're just kind of giving up. Um, you know, cause that can happen too. If, you know, things have just kind of gotten so, um, I, I don't know, they've become so toxic or things you've just experienced certain things over and over again, you can just kind of give up. I'm also wondering for you, do you think there's a way that society or people or whomever can say, you know, hey, I'm really concerned about you. There is this stuckness there without trying to, or without minimizing their experience or without minimizing their feelings, but also letting them know that at some point there's got to be something where you're not stuck anymore. Yeah. Um, I I know I'm emphasizing this a lot, but I think that self-compassion comes first and anger release and all along the way teaching people how to say no in all different forms. Learning that they can say no to even small things. Yes. Or they can have power in their life. They can motivate themselves enough to even make small changes. And if they can make small changes, then they feel empowered like, oh, Maybe I'm not so helpless. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can do something. Maybe I can achieve something. I also think that there uh, has to become a certain amount of self-awareness that has to come with um, self-compassion or just any of that, really, because I do think that people have to kind of pay attention to what's going on with them uh, mentally, physically, or, or what happens, what have you, when they're in these kind of situations like the presidential election or like something that happens on TV, right? Because I do think a lot of times people kind of react based on how they feel like that triggered me in some way and maybe they're not able to put it together um, right then and there. Um, but there's just a very strong emotional reaction. Do you have any tips on that? Just um, that whole kind of self-awareness and tuning in piece when something triggers you and you're not sure why. One of the best ways I I start is to have them list their triggers, have them know what their triggers are. And that Mm -hmm. making a list, it's not as simple as just making a list. Yes. It's really paying attention to your reactions, maybe even getting feedback from close family or close friends that you can trust Mm -hmm. as to what, what precedes their outbursts or what precedes their, their times when they seem to be really triggered, Mm -hmm. but to really pay attention to what their triggers are, make a list and really study that list until they know what their triggers are. So if they have a, an outburst or they have a, an episode where they just kind of freeze and can't speak or whatever the way they react to something that's happened, they can, maybe not in the moment, but they can go back and think, oh, okay, I know why I did that. I know why I said that. I know what was going on inside of me. I was triggered and I was remembering unconsciously, Hmm. but spontaneously reacting to something that happened before. And so that's one of the prime ways of, like you said, self-awareness is so important. Mm -hmm. And being aware of your own triggers, taking responsibility for your own triggers can be really, really empowering. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, I do also want to go back to a moment. You said that there was a fight, flight, or freeze when people are... um, approached by something and they just don't know how to react, but it's causing them this anxiety. Specifically, when people are in a situation or they have an encounter where they are frozen, you know, that fear, whatever causes them to freeze. Do you have any suggestions for people to kind of come out of that? Yes. Um, grounding or centering is always a really positive way of dealing with being triggered in any way, but the freezing especially. So um, 
first of all, not to judge themselves for freezing. It's an understandable way of reacting. But then to begin to come back, what, they also, what they've done is their body has become paralyzed, just like an animal. And that's just a natural physiological response. But they probably also dissociated. When they've frozen, they probably have dissociated, meaning they have left their body. They're, they're, you know, that natural reaction that we have, whether it's a car accident or when a person's being sexually molested, they automatically rise out of their body or they dissociate from their body in some way and they leave their body and their, their mind is somewhere else. And so a person freezing probably has dissociated. So bringing them themselves back into their body is really important. So grounding means you feel your feet on the ground, you take some deep breaths and you clear your eyes and you'll understand what that means if, as I talk here, you just open your eyes and look around and see where you are and notice sights and sounds and colors. Bring yourself back to the present, okay? Once you're back to the present, then you're gonna be able to take care of yourself, whether that means now you can run or now you can decide whether it's safe to fight, mm -hmm. okay? But if you're frozen or dissociated and or dissociated, you can't take care of yourself because you're not there. And I think most people by now understand that idea of lose, leaving your body and, and just having, and, and not having your mind there. That's why it's so hard for some people to remember their traumas, okay? Like when somebody has a major car accident, they will tell you they don't remember anything at, right, af, right at the impact or afterwards. And that's a defense mechanism to help them you know, it's too psychologically traumatic for them to have been there in their body and their mind be there and see and feel everything. So it's a self-protective mechanism. Absolutely. But it also keeps us from being present. It, and we have to be present and alert to really take care of ourselves. And unfortunately, a lot of people walk around yeah. dissociated a lot of the time. Yeah. And so they're not really capable of taking care of themselves when you're dissociated. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, one of the questions that I want to ask you about, which I think is important, is a lot of people, um, you know, especially in other cultures, uh, but also in our culture too, who have experienced being victimized um, and you know, as you mentioned with nice girls too, uh, they're still being victimized or they're still being oppressed um, in some ways by their abuser. Um, and I think, you know, for a lot of women, and this is something that's not talked about as much, um, they have to have a relationship or they feel as though they may have to have a relationship right. with their abuser, whether that abuser is a parent or someone that is close to them um, or, or what, whatever, in whatever capacity. Um, and I'm just curious because I can see this kind of stuff happening a lot, like the dissociative piece and the, just the being triggered a lot, especially when you have to have that, you, you, you've had these experiences, but for whatever the reason may be, you still have to have this person in your life. I'm just curious from, from your perspective, how, how should that be managed? Well, we know that women who are, whether they're being physically battered or emotionally abused, become isolated. And we all know the whole script there. You know, either because their partner discouraged them from having relationships with their family, told them they couldn't go out anymore with their friends, but for, or bec they become so ashamed of what's happening that they, you know, become isolated from their friends. So they need to break that chain of isolation they need to make contact with someone. Now, maybe calling a battered women's shelter or calling a crisis line or calling somebody and making having some contact. Because yes, if you're isolated and the only person you have in your whole life that you can be close to is the abusive partner, there's no way you can leave, okay? And especially because you probably have low self-esteem already and he's beaten you down emotionally or physically or she's beaten you down. 
and you don't believe you deserve any better. And so it just, you know, we know the whole cycle. So contact and connection with others is primary, whether it's just starting with a crisis call. Now battered women's shelters also work with people who are emotionally abused. They also do counseling for emotional abuse. They now identify emotional abuse as domestic violence. You know, going to your church, you got to be careful with that because some churches now, there's been a lot of progress. Some ministers, some churches now recognize that emotional abuse is a reason to have a, to, to have a divorce, to start a divorce, mm. that it's a legitimate reason. It's not just physical abuse. It's now emotional abuse, but that's rare. So if you go to your church, you got to be careful that you're not going to be lectured to, you know, like what's your part in this and you've got to stay with him. You know, you married, you know, you married somebody, you have to stay with him. You got to be careful what the message is. But there is counseling at churches, and there's definitely counseling at battered women's shelters, and there's definitely counseling at women's centers, crisis centers, and it's almost always either free or low cost. Absolutely. So having those contacts with other, with just a counselor, and then I always love it when women can go or men can go into a support group, because you're not just going to get the support of the counselor. You've got all these other people. You hear their stories. You find out that you're not alone, you find out strategies, you find out, you know, it's understandable that you act reacted this way because almost everybody else reacts that way too. You don't feel so alone. So if, the less alone you feel, the less dependent you're gonna be on him for your supplies, your emotional supplies. Absolutely. You know? So I think that's, I mean, it's, it sounds simplistic, but I think it's like one of the major things to be able to do. Even on, there's even now online support groups even if you can't go out of the house, you know, if, if you feel safe enough to go on the computer when he's gone or when she's gone, there's even online support groups. They're not as beneficial as, as in-person support groups, but even online, it's that breaking that, that dependence on one person to be your, your all. Absolutely. And getting feedback from other people, getting information from other people. Being receptive to that as well. And being I think. receptive, yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, it just out of curiosity for my listeners who be, may be listening, um, or who are listening, excuse me, to you, um, and I think you've given a, a lot of wonderful just nuggets for them to hold on to. But let's say um, for the listener, they're listening, and, and maybe they have experienced some things in their past. Uh, such as abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual, or even um, financial abuse, or mm -hmm. what, what have you. But they are thinking, um, this sounds good, but I think I'm doing okay, when they're really not. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs and symptoms of someone who's gone through this stuff? And it's not okay, but they think they are okay. Okay. Well, Does that makes sense. Sure, sure. I think a lot of people are in denial yes. that it's as bad as it is, but I think they might know on a deeper level that they're not okay. You know, a lot of women who are, and I'm saying women, but I do act, absolutely acknowledge that there are men who are being emotionally mm -hmm. abused. That it's, it's, in fact, there's more men that are being emotionally sure. abused we recognize. So yes. I do, I will tend to go back to the female. Yes. Um, a woman who's being emotionally abused uh, probably feels depleted. She probably feels exhausted a great deal of the time. Um, and she feels like a failure because a lot of women who, especially the ones who are in denial about being abused, feel like they're a failure. If I only did this, my husband would be happy. And that's the message the, the male partner gives or the female partner. It's your fault that I'm unhappy. It's your fault that I'm not successful. So she's constantly being, being blamed by her partner. And in addition, she probably has a tendency to blame herself. She probably has a tendency to take on all the blame in the relationship and to take on the idea that she's responsible for not only her partner's happiness, but for the success of the relationship. So that's a heavy burden. So she's probably exhausted. She's probably depressed. She may turn to alcohol. She may turn to drugs. She may turn to overeating. All those are ways to help her cope 
with this situation that makes her feel so bad. As hard as she tries, she can't make him happy. There's always something she's doing wrong. It must be because I'm stupid. It must be because I'm incompetent. You know, he tells me I'm not attractive enough for him to be turned on to me sexually. So I try to lose weight and then he gets jealous because men are noticing me. So I can't win. You know, talk about learned helplessness, right? Mm -hmm. So the major symptom is just absolute exhaustion and depression and feeling helpless and hopeless that you can't change the situation that no matter what I do, he's not going to be happy. Mm. Do what about for those that are a little bit more old school and I say old school, um, you know, in the kindest way possible, but there's a lot of people um, older adults, um, I encountered this with more so now um, than with people who are of the younger generation, but older adults specifically are like, you know, that's, that was in the past. I'm not gonna, you know, bring that stuff up. I'm just gonna, you know, put that up on the shelf and leave it there and close the door. Do you have any suggestions about that whole compartmentalization piece as well that because I also think that that's a very um that's a that's a piece that's also encountered as well yeah sure yeah when somebody's determined especially like with sexual issues sexual abuse that to not look at it uh I just want to offer them compassion that I understand sure why you would choose that why you wouldn't want to open that door yeah um, and I'm not going to try to talk you into facing all that pain and maybe exposing someone yeah. or, you know, I'm not going to try and talk you into that. But I would ask you to try to be as honest as you can with yourself about how does that, how does that experience manifest in your life today? How, you know, you want to leave it behind, but can you really leave it behind? is there a real way to leave it behind? And at what cost? When we leave something like that behind, we're cutting ourselves off from that. And we're also cutting ourselves off from a part of ourselves. Okay, so how does it manifest in your life? Um, one way, if we can't have compassion for ourselves about something that happened to us, we're not gonna have very much compassion for other victims. Okay, so are you? do you tend to be you know, a victim blamer? Do you tend to be critical of victims? Mm -hmm. Tend to be especially critical of victims who talk about their victimization? You know, is that one of the ways it manifests? Are you even critical of maybe a beloved family member mm. who suffered from some kind of abuse and you're, you don't want to hear it? You don't want to hear about it. Or you just keep telling them, yeah. you know, just, just get strong and move on, mm. you know? So that could be a way that, that it manifests in a, in a pretty painful way for you and the people you love, you know, because we really can't put it away. The bottom line is we can't put it away totally. It's going to come up in some ways. Maybe you get triggered when you see something similar to what happened to you. Maybe you have a really strong reaction and maybe you drink too much because of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you can't have compassion for other victims, especially even your, your beloved you know, family members. Maybe you're too harsh with your own children because you're so afraid something like that's going to happen to them that you demand that they take care of themselves. And if, God forbid, if they have a problem and they slip, you can't be there for them. You're just going to criticize them and blame them. Like, why did you go to that party anyway? Why were you, why were you wearing those clothes? The typical criticism that we criticize victims. Or why do you stay with that guy? Just leave him. Just don't be stupid. Just leave him. You know, and we don't understand why she can't leave him. Well, it's because you haven't faced your own. If you were battered in a relationship and you finally got out and your grown daughter ends up in a battering relationship, you may or may not be able to be there and be supportive. You'd think you would because you had the experience. You think you would be compassionate toward her. But very often, those women who have, want to put it away and not, never talk about it and who are ashamed of their own victimization, they, won't, they can't be there for their daughter. Yeah. They're just critical of her. Well, I got away. Why don't you? Or how in the world did you get in that situation? 
You know, I raised you to be different, right? Yes. Well, yeah, maybe you did raise her to be more assertive, but you know, you had that experience. You know how hard it is to not get into those situations. You know how hard it is to not leave, you know, and you could help her. You could be there and truly help her, but your own denial and not wanting to look at what happened to you gets in your way. So there's a price to pay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you can try to put it all away, but there's usually a pretty strong price to pay. Yeah. And I mean, as you're talking, you know, that can be perceived as in a layer of abuse in itself, yeah. you know, that you're kind of um, uh, projecting onto someone else as a result of not dealing with your own stuff. Yeah. Which is I mean, kind of, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of mothers whose husbands sexually abuse their own children and they turn a blind eye. And it's not even just turning a blind eye. They actually can't even see it when it's right in front of them because their own level of denial about having been sexually abused themselves is so powerful. I mean, I have an extreme case from years ago where I ended up being able to work with the mother of a victim and the daughter said, you know, mom, we've sat in the living room every night and Dad sat next to me and we had a blanket over us and he was molesting me while you were in the living room with us while we were all watching TV. And I knew, I know you knew it. And the mother said, no, I wouldn't. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Finally, after weeks and weeks of therapy, the mother broke down and cried and said, I did know. I did know, but I just didn't want to see it. I didn't want to see that it was happening to you because that's something similar to what happened to me. Wow. You know, that's really profound. And that's how it can manifest itself when you don't want to look at your own issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I want to give you some time and space. Tell us again your new book and when is that coming out? When should we look for it? Okay, it's out now. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, I'm saying no, I'm saying no, standing up against sexual assault, sexual harassment, and sexual pressure. Okay. Uh, and it's a, a book for every woman. It's very comprehensive, but it's especially good for either mothers to read and then share with their adult daughters or daughters that are leaving home or for young women, young, it, it arms young women for any kind of situation, whether it's how to, how to protect themselves from date rape drugs, to how to stand up to, you know, to, them, to, to the men that are coming on to them. Uh, it, I talk about sexual pressure. I talk about even in a relationship, you need to know your boundaries, your sexual boundaries. You know, we were going to talk about narcissism and more, but maybe yes. we can do that another time. Yes. Narcissists in particular um, like to explore sexually. Okay, they, they lack the ability, most of them, to really intimately connect on a deep level with their partners. So they have to keep something going. They, they, need, they feel like they need excitement in order to have a relationship continue. They have a, a really powerful fantasy life. And so narcissists tend to, to go to their partners and have all kinds of ideas about what to do, whether it's sado, sadomasochism and bondage or you know, all kinds of other stuff, you know, anal sex and stuff that, that, you know, they want to do, they want to explore. And it's really important that a partner of a narcissist knows how to say no. They know what their boundaries are. So I encourage them, look, make a list. I have a list in my book that I'm saying no of all the sexual activities that are possible. Read that list, put a check mark against either on the ones you do want to do or you're open to and the ones that you're absolutely not willing to do and learn how to say no and stand up to him because it will only continue the sexual you try one thing and then there will be another one especially with a narcissist it's never going to end okay and you're selling your soul you're losing respect for yourself and probably losing respect from the narcissistic partner yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and yes, you're right. Um, so I, this interview did go in a direction and I take full responsibility. Well, I'm, I'm fine with it. I loved your question. I absolutely loved your question. Thank and you. I thought it was a great interview. That's um, awesome. But yeah, that's my latest book and yeah. I'd love it if people would read it. Absolutely. And I'm definitely going to make sure I put that as well as some of your others definitely in the show notes. So people can definitely pick those up. I think you have a lot of 
um, great insights. You hit a lot of things spot on. Are there any upcoming projects or things that people can support you with or look for you? Where can they find you and that kind of stuff? Well, I'm writing a book now called Escaping. What is it called? Escaping. Well, it's about escaping the shame in an in a, in emotionally abusive relationship. Okay. I've forgotten the title now, <laughs> but, but it's coming out next year. Uh, so, um, you know, look for that. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, what about if people want to reach out and contact you or things like that, where can they find you and write to you? Well, email is best. Okay. Uh, Beverly at Beverly Engel. That's E N G E L dot com. Beverly at Beverly Engel dot com. Absolutely. And I'll definitely yeah. make sure to put that in the show notes. And okay. we'll definitely have to have you back on as a friend okay. of the show to talk about narcissism. <laughs> but I definitely think there's a lot of gems from here. And I cannot wait to have this episode air. And I thank you so very much for taking You're the welcome. time. Thank you. You're a great interviewer. I love the free flowing you know, <laughs> style. So thank you too. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I hope that you enjoyed listening to that show with uh, Beverly Ingle. I had a really fun time doing it with her. And, you know, um, one thing I will say, although I kind of deviated from the topic, podcasting, writing, anything that I do is a very creative process for me. So I kind of just have to go with where the flow and my curiosity takes me. So I will definitely try to have her back on the show to talk about the subject matter of narcissism. So thank you so much for tuning in with us today. If you'd like to further connect um, with folks who have also been in abusive and you know, relationships in which they've experienced a fair amount of trauma and you're looking for support, um, please do join a Date with Darkness Facebook group. If you want to connect with me, if you have some questions uh, that you want to get answered on the show, or if you have some questions or commentary for me, please do reach out at a date with darkness at gmail.com. I've been getting some lovely emails from my listeners, uh, people who really like where the show is going. They've liked the topics covered, people who want to suggest topics or people who have questions. One thing I will ask though, is that if you're having a question, a relationship question that you want me to answer on the show please keep the question very short a minimum of or a maximum of five sentences uh, some people have written me letters the bun letters the bun letters so just fyi there um and as always i enjoy you listening to the show but if you're looking for additional ways of supporting the show please go to uh, their favorite podcast provider and leave a, po um, a positive review, you know, write a little something that always helps. Also be sure to subscribe to this show and recommend this show to a friend, family member, coworker, or even a foe. So thank you so much. And until next time, be well.